like to introduce John McKay, who will do the introduction for our assembly today. John. Uh, can we just get the short please, in the back? Um, first, I'd like to welcome Dane Frey to your first upper school assembly. Yeah. Um, I think one of the best ways to enjoy poetry is to have it read aloud. There's something very special about the human voice. Um, I like to think of it as reading the lyrics of a song and then hearing a terrific singer sing. Um, I remember when I was a teenager, I tried to attempt it to read Ulysses by James Joyce, which is a very complex book. And I had a rough time with it. But then when I heard my father read it uh, passages aloud, it really came alive to me. And to this day, if I read Ulysses, I can hear the old man's voice. And I think today, if you listen really carefully and concentrate, these poems will stay with you for a really long time because we have a very gifted man in the house right, today. And he's been called the, uh, the world's greatest living poet. won the Nobel Prize. But in addition to that, he's the nicest man on the planet. I will say that again. He's the nicest man on the planet. And please welcome to Shane Steen. Things within me. 
It's very simple. It's a very simple metaphor. Now, I got the idea of it when I was driving around the right angle of Ben late at night in the early 1960s, uh, changing gear from uh, fourth gear to third gear to second gear on a bad corner. And uh, somehow in that muscular change, I got the idea of the change of gear in my own family, from grandfather to father to myself, grandson, <coughs> going from the land, from the farm, to, to the, into uh, an educated environment, into the university, into writing. So the basic metaphor is uh, pen to spade to pen, very obvious, skull digging. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean, rasping sound when the spade sinks into gravelly ground. My father digging. I look down till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up twenty years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug, the shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. By God, the old man could handle a spade, just like his old man. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's ball. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sobs over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf. Digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. But I have no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. Uh, private experience 
I used to love to look at Don Wells when I was a youngster. This was 50 years ago in rural County Derry in Northern Ireland, <coughs> when it was still, to some extent, almost the tail end of a medieval way of life. There was still, water was still got from wells. And the wells had windlasses that were deep, and you could look down and see your reflection in the bottom of them. And you could call down the wells and hear the echo coming back. So this, this uh, business of hearing yourself coming back and seeing yourself in reflection, that really is one of the, one of the big impulses in, in all our form, playing, music, whatever, singing, ex self-expression is the same. So this poem is called Personal Helicon, and it tries to link the local, I don't think it's on the list now, but it's very straightforward, it won't be in many ways here in Jerusalem. It's, um, the word Helicon, as you know, is the name of a mountain in Greece. And on the Mount Helicon, there was a well sacred to the muses. If you drank from this well, you would be inspired. So I, my inspiration, as it were, comes from these other local wells. So this brings together the local and the, the local fact and the reach of one's culture right back into Greece. As a child, they couldn't keep me from wells and old pumps with buckets and windlasses. I loved the dark drop, <coughs> the trapped sky, the smells of waterweed, fungus and dank moss. One in a brickyard with a rotted board top. I savored the rich crash when a bucket plummeted down at the end of a rope, so deep you saw a reflection in it. A shallow one under a dry stone ditch, fructified like any aquarium. When you dragged out the long roots from the soft mulch, a white face hovered over the bottom. Others had echoes, gave back your own call with the clean new music in it. And one was scarcer, for there, out of ferns and tall foxgloves, a rat slapped across my reflection. Now, to fry into roots, to finger slime, to stare big-eyed Narcissus into some spring is beneath all adult dignity. I rhyme to see myself, to set the darkness echoing. about it, once again, any artwork, music, poetry, painting, sculpture, so on. It has two, two commands, it's two, it's, it has two sides to it, and often a work will go towards one side or the other side. On the, fir on the first level, it must be, well, to take poetry, it must be something in language that has that is, as the poet Hawkins said, framed for contemplation. It must be a whole thing in, in language. A poem, if you could say, is an event in language. So you can talk about it, about its rhymes, about its uh, meter, about its line endings, about quality of language. The medium, just as an art historian or an art critic can talk about a painting in terms of its forms and balances and music can be talked about. So there is that. There's that actual technical beauty, if you like, you want from Barthorne. Uh, but you also want work to be true to the world you live in. You want it to have something to say to your being in the world. You want it to have some <coughs> purchase and some relationship <coughs> to the life you are going through with. So in Northern Ireland, In Northern Ireland, uh, naturally, for the last 25 years, there, 30 years, there has been more than poetry going on. There has been a lot of uh, crisis, and a lot of violence, and a lot of atrocity. And the question you ask <coughs> is, what is the relationship between what you are doing with words and what is atrociously happening?
happening in your society. People have to ask this in moments of crisis in all society. And uh, you have to be answerable to that. I read two poems which are somewhat in, diff in different ways answerable to the danger and the violence. The first one is a strange poem it's on, the, on your sheet, some of you have it called The Tolerant Man. It was written in the early 1970s. The subject is the is a head, the head of a man. This head was on a body that was found in a bog in Jutland, was perfectly preserved by the teeth, was found in the 1950s. The people who found it thought it might have been a murder victim. It was quite freshly, uh, it seemed quite, quite uh, a new corpse. But the fact is, when it all was examined, this corpse was about 1,500 years old, perhaps, or more. And it was a body that had been ritually um, murdered. It had been strangled and put into the, the bog with a, a little skin cap on the head, a little girdle. And the face of this man is very, very peaceful. It's very serene, even though he has been strangled. And anyone who saw the photographs of this tall man, who was found at the place called Tall, is always struck by the aura of stillness. But it's a human face from 15, 16, 1700 years ago, which is laid in, in the peat. And it looks, uh, it's, quite, it's quite strange to account for that. But it turns out, the idea is, the theory is that, the, that this body and other bodies like it were part of a, a fertility ritual. That this man was wedded to the goddess of the earth. And Made, 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 made her bright room, taken around the district on a chart or a tumble, and then ritually wedded to her, which involved strangling him and putting him into the bog with her. The bog, the, the bog was, the, was the marriage bed. And then when he lay with her in the marriage bed, of course the spring came back. He was a sacrifice to the, to the life energy and the flowers and the crops and the trees came back because of this union. <clears throat> that at least is the theory that the archaeologists have. But this linked in my mind to the idea of rebirth that is behind many violent revolutionary movements has been uh, especially since the 19th century. Irish republicanism is one of these movements but not the only one, in which the in which the, the, the warriors go out to renew the spirit of the land against the oppressor. Uh, this was very very common, alas, 20th century uh, notion also. People went into the First World War with the idea that the world would be renewed through the shedding of blood and so on. Anyway, this poem in this poem I, I try to link the sorrows of the man in Tolland with the uh, tragedies and the unremitting cycles of uh, violent uh, action in, in Irish political life. It's called the Tolland Man. I think it's on this. Someday I will go to Orvos to see his peak brown head, the mild pods of his eyelids, his pointed skin cap. In the flat country nearby where they dug him out, his last gruel of winter seeds caked in his stomach, naked except for the cap, noose and girdle, I will stand a long time. Right room to the goddess, she tightened her torque on him and opened her fen. Those dark juices working him to a saint's kept body, probed with the turf cutter's honeycombed workings. Now his stained face reposes at Orgos. I could risk blasphemy, consecrate the Colvin Bog our holy ground, and pray him to make germinate the scattered, ambushed flesh of laborers, stocking corpses laid out in the farmyards, telltale skin and teeth flecking the sleepers of 
four young brothers trailed for miles along the lines. Something of his sad freedom as he rode the tumble should come to me, driving, saying the names Tolland, Grobal, Nadelford, watching the pointing hands of country people, not knowing their tongue. Out there in Jutland, in the old man-killing parishes, I would feel lost, unhappy, and at home. Voices, 
head hooded and the cold nose gone. Or in your driving mirror, tailing <coughs> headlights that pulled out suddenly and flagged you down where you weren't known <coughs> and far from what you knew, the lowland clays and waters of Loch Bay, Church Island Spire, its soft tree line of you. Across that strand of yours, the cattle graze, up to their bellies in an early mist. And now they turn their unbewildered gaze to where we work our way through squeaking sage, drowning in dew. <coughs> like a dull blade with its edge home bright, Loch Bay half shines under the haze. I turn because the sweeping of your feet has stopped behind me to find you on your knees with blood and roadside muck in your hair and eyes. Then kneel in front of you in brimming grass and gather up cold handfuls of the dew to wash you, cousin. I dab you clean with moss, fine as the drizzle out of a low cloud. I lift you under the arms and lay you flat. With brushes that shoot green again, I plait green scapulars to wear over your shroud. Settles down to nest. 
Kevin feels the warm eggs, the small breast, the tucked neat head and claws, and finding himself linked into the network of eternal life is moved to pity. Now he must hold his hand like a branch out in the sun and rain for weeks until the young are hatched and fledged and flown. And since the whole thing's imagined anyhow, imagine being Kevin, which is he, self-forgetful or in agony all the time from the neck all out down through his hurting forearms? Are his fingers sleeping? Does he still feel his knees? Or has the shut-eyed blank of under-earth crept up through him? Is there distance in his head? Alone and mirrored clear in love's deep river, to labor and not to seek reward, he prays. A prayer his body makes entirely, for he has forgotten self, forgotten bird, and on the river bank, forgotten the river's name. You know what they say about me and the stuff. 
But they've got it wrong, and the truth is simple. A drop would have saved that gardener's life. I am saddened, bitter, and broken-hearted to find you in scribes on the rushy tufts, and the big rats scampering down the rat paths to wake your carcass and have their fun. If you could have got word to me in time, bird, that you were in trouble and craved a sup, I'd have struck the fetters of those log waters and have wet your thrapple with the blow I struck. Your common birds do not concern me, the blackbirds say, or the thrush or heron, but the yellow but bitter, my handsome namesake, with my looks and locks, he's the one I mourn. Constantly he was drinking, drinking, and by all accounts I am just the same. But every drop I get, I'll dull it, for fear I might get my death of thirst. The woman I love says to give it up now, or else I'll go to an early grave. But I say no and keep resisting, for taking drinks what's prolonged your days. You saw for yourselves a while ago what happened to the bird when his throat went dry. So my friends and neighbors, let it flow. You'll be stood no rounds in eternity. <laughs> Hesitates, a 
those in frightened scots rest in its leaves. But what disturbs me most in the living wood is the to and fro and to and fro and oak rod. Just say two little quick short things. One, this poem I wrote about 30 32 or 32, three years ago, to make up, I had a row with the girlfriend, and I threw this in through the letterbox, uh, and I thought it would be waiting for that for her when she came back from school. It worked perfectly okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll do this, uh, and then I'll do it out in a short one. This is called Scaffolding. Masons, masons, when they start upon a building, are careful to test out the scaffolding. Make sure that planks won't slip at busy points. Secure all ladders. Tighten bolted joints. And yet all this comes down when the job's done. Showing off walls of sure and solid stone. So if, my dear, there sometimes seem to be old bridges breaking between you and me, never fear. We can let the scaffolds fall, confident that we have built our wall. Yes. <laughs> and then this is a little poem, which was really written by the daughter of that girlfriend who became my wife from this, as I said, a mother of um, And this is called Catherine's poem. Because there are two things that my daughter Catherine said which was very small, and I just put them together and made a poem of them. It's just four lines. Catherine's poem. She says, Aren't poems like your toys, Daddy? Catherine said. And didn't you and Mummy make me? And God made the thread. Thank you.